I have the great pleasure of introducing to you this morning the new president of California State University, Sacramento. And I have two stories to tell before I get into his bio. And he has an extensive bio, but it's important that you know this about him. If you happen to see a middle-aged, balding, <laughs> Caucasian male with cowboy boots <laughs> climbing in a red Tacoma Toyota pickup truck, <laughs> do not be in a hurry to be snippy. <laughs> it might be the president. We have a president who shows emotion. He really does. This morning, I got here early, and he's an early bird. So I saw him at the bottom of the stairs with tears in his eyes. And I said to him, Mr. President, what's going on? He said, I had this terrible dream last night. And I said, tell me more. He said, you know, I only got here just about two months ago. And last night I dreamt that the people do not like me. <laughs> and he was teary-eyed. I said to him, Mr. President, stop it. I said, it's only a dream. <laughs> and he said, yes, but it was a terrible dream. And I said, listen, Mr. President, it could have been real. <laughs> he was born January 21st, 1952, in Brigham City, Utah. And he grew up on a ranch in Montana. He earned his bachelor's and master's degree in political science from Brigham Young University and his doctorate from the University of Chicago's Committee on Social Thought, where his field of study, his fields of study were modern literature, modern philosophy, and modern political theory. His experience in public higher education spanned nearly three decades. Most of it spent in the University of Texas system. We do not hold that against him. <laughs> he was president of UT Pan American from 2010 to 2014. In 1989, 1990, he taught English at the University of Illinois at Ch Chicago before joining the faculty at the University of Texas, Dallas where he founded the creative writing program and served as its director. During his 18 years at UT Dallas, he also was a professor of literary and aesthetic studies and served as vice provost. I understand that with his aesthetic studies background, the staff in the office has had to keep hitting his hand for him not to decorate the place. Among his many awards and honors, he was named 2014 Man of the Year by the Rio Grande, Rio Grande Valley Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and received a Literary Champion Award from South Texas Literary Coalition in 2012. This spring, the Edinburgh City Council unanimously voted to rename the city street that runs through the center of Edinburgh campus with his name on it. He is Sacramento State's eighth permanent president. He comes to Sacramento with his wife, Jody um, Nee Hawkins. Ladies and gentlemen, students, staff, faculty, friends, well-wishers, let me introduce to you the president 
of California State University, Sacramento, for whom a city street that runs through the center of Edinburgh campus has his name on it, <laughs> Dr. Robert Nelson. Well, you just ruined one of my lines. <laughs> I'm going to speak off the cuff just for a second, and then I have to be presidential and read a speech and everything else. Um, we hit, last night, 30,023 students. That's amazing. And it's amazing because I know that you will take care of them. I believe that. And I believe in you. And so now to do this, and I only get to do this a couple times a year where you've actually got to deliver a speech and everything else. It's a lot easier just to talk to people. But here we go. By now, everyone has heard this story, but it is the perfect story to begin my first fall address, my first time to talk to the faculty, staff, and students at Sacramento State. It is the story of Sac State. Last Friday, August 21st, one of our students, Anthony Sadler, and two of his Sacramento friends saved the lives of countless persons on a high-speed train between Amsterdam and Paris. Anthony is a senior in kinesiology. He's a member of the philosophy club and of the Kappa Sigma fraternity here at Sac State. And Anthony and his two friends, Spencer Stone and Alexander Scarlatos, are heroes, true heroes. The three Americans, with the help of one other British fellow, subdued a shooter with an AK-47, a knife, and a handgun. The shooter had eight magazines filled with bullets. There is no telling how many people would have been killed if it weren't for the actions of Anthony and his friends. I ask us all to applaud Anthony, to applaud his bravery, to applaud his parents and Sac State for what he did and what his parents and Sac State taught him. I am certainly learning from Anthony. He is teaching me what it means to be American and what it means to be human. Today, we are launching a website to collect funds to pay for his tuition this year and to help pay off whatever loans he may have accumulated for, to pay for his education. Two years ago, Sacramento State adopted a new mission statement. As California's capital university, we transform lives by preparing students for leadership, service, and success. Anthony Sadler is the embodiment of that mission statement. In subduing the gunman, he risked his life for others. Service, leadership, success, those are precisely the qualities that Anthony exhibited on that train. Leadership, service, and success are the qualities that I see every day at Sac State, that I see when I meet our faculty, when I talk to our staff, when I do a selfie 
with the students. <laughs> I'm proud to be a Hornet, and I'm proud to be part of the Hornet Nation. I left one valley, the Rio Grande Valley, for another valley, the Sacramento Valley. What the Rio Grande Valley and the Sacramento Valley have in common is some of the biggest hearted people that I have ever met. In both valleys, they care about our students and they care about our universities because they truly understand that we are transforming lives. People ask me time and again, what has surprised me about Sacramento? What has surprised both Jody and me is how warmly the people in Sacramento and the Sacramento region have embraced me and her. They have reached out and embraced us because they love Sacramento State and because they believe in our mission. Sac State truly is all about our students. In this transition to a new leadership, we cannot forget that we are all about our students. Unfortunately, most of you do not know Jody and me, and frankly, I would be lying if I said I knew you. I have much to learn about Sacramento State, and I'm fully aware that Sacramento State is not UT Fan American, and what worked in the Rio Grande Valley may not work here at Sac State. I greatly dislike how the search process for new presidents work nowadays. I hate that I didn't get the opportunity to meet all of you during the search, and that I'm only meeting you now. And I don't like it that you are only meeting me now, and that the huge majority of you had no say in whom your next president was going to be. When I was interviewing for the presidency at UT Pan American, I had the chance to meet with student government, the staff assembly, faculty senate, but I also had the chance to speak at an open forum and to answer some very tough questions. The hardest question of all in that forum was from a member of the faculty senate. She said, and I quote, convince me in Spanish that I should send my son to your university <laughs> and do it with passion. <laughs> faculty senate. She was Hispanic, and 89% of the students at the university were Hispanic. Over 70% of the students were the first to go to college in their families. And over 60% of the students primarily spoke Spanish at home. And there I was, a bald white guy, <laughs> wanting to be the president of that university on the border between US and Mexico. Well, fortunately, I had my first Spanish class in fourth grade in Montana. And unknowns to her, I'm fluent in Spanish. I have already done three um, different presentations, appeared three times on Univision, and it is not Univision. <laughs> Univision here in Sacramento. And so I gave a passionate plea to the audience to send their sons and daughters to UT Pan American because we would take care of their sons and daughters and because we would transform their lives and because we would lift their sons and daughters out of poverty and thereby transform the Rio Grande Valley. When I finished, I got a standing ovation and the faculty member became a very good friend and confidant. Now the line that you ruined, but I'm delivered anyway, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to get a standing ovation today. <laughs> and I have a long way to go before you and I become friends and confidants. But I want you to know that I believe in the Hornet family. I believe in Anthony Sadler and I believe in you. Most of all, I believe in our students. I believe that they can and will succeed. I know that you believe that they can and will succeed. That is why most of you came 
to Sacramento State, and that is why you have stayed. I am entirely student-centered, and I chose to come to Sacramento State because of its laser-like focus on students. As most of you know, I worked myself out of a job at UT Pan American because of my students. My students didn't have to take their science class and their labs in the, sci in the same semester. We simply didn't have enough labs. They sometimes had to wait two or three years to take their labs. You see, we had not had a new building, a new academic building, on our campus since 2001. Our students had less than half the space that the students at University of Texas at El Paso had. Why? Because UTEP and all the other universities in the UT system had access to the permanent university fund, $14.98 billion in West Texas oil money, money that could be used to build buildings. We discovered a loophole in the Texas Constitution that would give us access to that $14.98 billion if we abolished two sister institutions, UT Pan American and UT Brownsville, and created a new university. I knew when we discovered that loophole that I would probably result in my having, not having a job if we succeeded. And I also knew that we had to succeed for the sake of our students. We got an unanimous vote in the House and in the Senate, something that very rarely happens in Texas. <laughs> but the legislature knew that we had to do something for the students in the Rio Grande Valley. And today, there is $348 million in construction happening at the new university, UTRGV. There is a new medical school with 200 students being admitted every year. And there is a new science building with 42 labs. <laughs> yes, I worked myself out of a job. UT System believed that they needed someone not associated with either campus as they combined the campuses together, someone who would be neutral but I did it for my students. And I would do it here too. If we're, there's some way that we could get 348 million. <laughs> As I said, I am like Sac State, student focused. Because of my focus, on students, I've got several requests that go something like this. If you really care about students, you'll fix X, Y, and Z that happened in the past. Although I hate to admit my fallibility, I can do very little about the past. My first and foremost request of everyone in this room today is to look to the future to work for our students' future, for their success. In most convocation speeches, now would be the time where the president would first introduce all of the new people out there, and then would go on to laud a lot of the individuals for the amazing accomplishments during the last year. And there have been some amazing accomplishments here, but I want to focus on the future and I want you to get to know me. I need to lay out the budget, because the budget will determine much of the future. And then I want to provide you with a look into my work plan, into what I am telling Chancellor Tim White and the Board of Trustees that I will be doing this year and what I hope to accomplish. First, the budget. Martin Luther King once said that a budget is a moral document. I concur. That is why we are allocating more than $1 million in this year's budget for equity raises. And we are being aggressive with enhancing safety and even more so with supporting student success and completion initiatives. 
Overall, we ha will have a balanced budget of $286,592,137, in which our projected source of funds matches our projected expenditures. In other words, we will be spending every dollar that we receive so there is no margin for error. After reviewing UBAC's recommendations, I have approved two tiers of divisional increases. Because academic affairs and student affairs are so focused on students, they will receive 1.9% more than they received last year. Academic affairs will also receive approximately 1.36 million in permanent baseline funding for instruction, for hiring new faculty. <laughs> they will need that because we are growing and we will continue to grow. We are expected to grow at least 460 additional students in this coming year. The remaining divisions, advancement, IRT, HR, public affairs, etc., will receive a 1.5% augmentation. $1.56 million has also been allocated to help attain the university's strategic goals and address the student success and completion initiatives. Given our priority to increase retention rates and our graduation rates and to decrease our students' time to degree, we will be advertising and hiring someone, a graduation czar or graduation czarina, <laughs> to evaluate, oversee, and coordinate and improve our student success programs and initiatives. We will also be adding additional professional and faculty advisors. We are enhancing support centers for our DREAM Act students and for our African American students. <laughs> while, continually, while continuing to fully support our full circle project for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. In the budget, we also added supplemental funding on top of the 1.5% increase to two divisions, athletics and university advancement for new needed personnel. To help meet NCA reporting requirements, athletics is receiving funding for two business officers. And to protect the safety of our student athletes, we are also adding a trainer to the athletics budget. We are gearing up for a for the university's first capital campaign. So gift officers have been added to the advancement budget to ramp up the campaign and to supplement the college's fundraising abilities and efforts. We also added $100,000 in one-time funding for operating costs associated with the capital campaign. We will not be able to raise money without appropriately investing in the campaign. With regards to one-time projects, one-time project funds, of the $31.6 million in requests, I'm sorry, I couldn't give it all to you. <laughs> I have approved 16.5 million in total projects. Upon reviewing the initial recommendations, I believed it was important to fund some very serious deferred maintenance hazard such as hazardous waste abatement and water exposure problems. We also addressed items that directly affect the safety of our faculty, staff, and students, such as trip hazards and firewalls. Finally, because we are going to grow our FTE student body by 2%, we're supplying academic affairs with an additional $1 million in one-time funding to add additional sections and courses. In other words, academic affairs will have 1.36 million for permanent tenure track hiring, plus it will have 1 million for lecturers, or as we call them here, temporary faculty. I wish that I could have 
dedicated the one million to permanent hires, but as I said, it is one-time money that will not be recurring. Still, the good news is that we are adding to academic affairs budget 2.36 million in instruction, in addition to the 1.9 percent increase that it is receiving. I'm asking the provost to put a priority on maximizing the number of faculty hires this coming year, and we will continue to increase the number of tenure track hires in the years that come after this year. I greatly appreciate the work of UBAC and the Office of Budget and Planning and Administration in preparing this year's budget. In the fall, we will be reinstituting the annual budget presentation during which we will roll out the budget in more detail. At the end of the fiscal year, we will also be instituting and inviting the entire university community to an annual financial review where we will discuss how the actual budget was spent. We have important work to do here as we increase freshman and transfer graduation rates, decrease the time to degree, provide the classes that our students need, and close the achievement gaps. This budget will allow us to make substantial progress. So onward to my work plan. I think it will show you what my priorities are and what my vision for Sac State is. First and foremost, and I hate PowerPoints, I have to believe that they're PowerPointless, but they're gonna do. <laughs> they, Lisa made me do it, okay. <laughs> First and foremost, I intend to work with the faculty, staff, students, and community to improve graduation rates. We're doing a lot of good work at our university, but too much of that work is happening in silos. We aren't necessarily measuring the effectiveness of what we are doing. We've been working on the graduation initiative for years, but we have hardly moved the, no the graduation rate needle. A 9% graduation rate for our four-year students is unacceptable. A 46% graduation rate for our six-year students is not acceptable either. Both rates drop even further with regards to underrepresented minority students, 7% and 38% respectively. Please believe me, I know that graduation rates are an artificial measure that were created by the NCAA to try to force athletics departments to monitor student athletes and make sure that the student athletes graduated. Not every student is or should be on a four or a six year track. Every student needs to be treated as an individual. And we should never lower our standards or the quality of education that we provide for our students just so they graduate sooner. Still, graduation rates do help paint a picture, even if it is a fuzzy picture, and even if it's a flawed picture about how our first-time, full-time students are doing. We need to make certain that it's not just, that we are not just spinning our wheels when it comes to reducing our students' time to degree. Hence, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be hiring a graduation initiative czar or czarina to coordinate and oversee our efforts. He or she will report directly to me and will be on the president's cabinet. That's how important I believe that these initiatives are and how critical this person will be to our success. I have only been here in Sacramento for a couple of months, but I have picked up on one mount mantra. The word that I've heard most often here at Sac State by both faculty and students is bottleneck. <laughs> we have bottlenecks everywhere, whether it is with registration, the absolute lack of courses, or extremely difficult gateway courses. The graduation czar or czarina will be charged to identify 
and conduct an inventory of those bottlenecks and to work with the faculty, the deans, the advisors, the chairs, with everyone at the university to eliminate those bottlenecks. We need a multiple pronged approach. Online classes can help in some instances, though many classes are not suited well for online courses. We need to support those who choose to teach those online courses. We need a center for online learning, teaching, and teaching, where faculty can receive training and incentives such as a new laptop for teaching online. We need to vet all our courses, all online courses, through Quality Matters, a national rubric to make certain that the courses are sufficiently rigorous. I, t I intend to establish as a priority the filling of the slots for bottleneck courses before staffing any other courses. Doing so requires that I help make connections with various hospitals, with companies, so that we can have internships, so that we can have clinical rec rotations for our practicums. That is why I've been meeting with Kaiser Permanente, Dignity, and Sutter Hospitals during my first weeks here. I also need to provide the deans and the faculty with the means to know what courses the students need and how many students need those courses. Hence, we will be buying, purchasing Smart Planner, a degree planning software that will allow students to see online their degree plans and their progress towards graduation. This software will allow students to run what-if scenarios, and faculty and advisors will be able to communicate with students regarding their progress. All of that is nice, but there is a more important reason why we are purchasing Smart Planner. Smart Planner will help us know who needs what classes and when in order to graduate in a timely fashion. We are also purchasing Platinum Analytics which can, so to speak, talk to Smart Planner and run a report on how many students need X, Y, and Z courses. Deans and faculty will know three months in advance how many sections the students will need. Just as importantly, Platinum Analytics will talk with our class scheduling software and will automatically schedule the needed courses. With these three pieces of software, we will completely eliminate this particular bottleneck as long as we follow through on hiring additional faculty. If this sounds familiar, it is because we said that we were going to start the project last year as a pilot project. No more pilots. We will begin with the actual installation for all programs in January, and it will be up and running by September of next year, working in the summer as well. We are setting aside the funds for backfill positions and for students to input the degree plans. There can be no more excuses. <clears throat> You, especially the students, have my word. To improve our graduation rates, we have to reach back into the high schools and even grade schools to ensure that the students are prepared. 56% of our first year students are in remedial cl cl classes. That means 56% of our first year students are gathering debt. The statistics nationwide are frightening regarding the success of students who have to take remedial classes. 37% of these students will never even take a load-bearing course. We are going to work with NextEd to build a strong P16 council. We need to communicate and collaborate with the high schools to ensure that students are prepared for the rigors of college. 
We need to provide the teachers with the curriculum that will match the curriculum of our beginning composition and algebra courses. I have already reached out to the Sacramento City Unified School District and other superintendents, and everyone has been receptive and opting to adopting our California curriculum. More importantly, using our P16 Council and using the tremendous outreach of our faculty, we need to start a literacy movement in, Sa in the Sacramento region. We know that if students are not reading at third grade level, in third grade, 80% of those students will drop out before completing high school and before ever enrolling in Sac State. Given the work that our faculty are already doing in the community, and given the energy of Sac State, I am confident that we can reduce the number of students in remedial education and thereby reduce student debt. We need to rethink how we are teaching remedial education, and we will do so, so that our students are not caught on the treadmill of remedial work. Maybe we will do it by creating concurrent remedial courses that students will take alongside course load-bearing courses. Maybe we'll do it using diagnostics and modular courses. But we will do it. We will do it together. I need all of you to help me find solutions. Okay, I've probably gone on too long about the first one. <laughs> but it lets you know how important I think it is to me and to this university. So let's move to the second of nine initiatives in my work plan. <laughs> and we'll get them faster as we go along, okay? <laughs> Improving retention rates. We need, to focus, we need to focus on retention rates. And I think that we often, too often, only focus on the first year retention rate instead of looking at all four years. The first year is quite good. 82% of our students return and become sophomores. Things get a little dicier in the second year. With the fall 2013 cohort, only 72% return. And that's 72% of the original 3,366 freshmen. Where I really get concerned is in our senior year. Only 65% of our students return of the original 3,366 students. Only 65% return as seniors. In other words, when we get to this senior year, 606 students have dropped out. That is a number that is much more important than graduation rate numbers. So how? Will we help these 606 students so that they don't drop out? We will initiate a college-ready program, and we plan to fund it with $100,000. Similarly, we will initiate an upper division-ready program, and we will fund it with $100,000. And for the seniors, we will initiate a career-ready program, which we will fund with $100,000. We are putting our money where our mouths are. I believe that while these initiatives will have measurable effects, increasing the number of advisors and degree auditors by approximately 10, and the number of faculty advisors in the colleges by approximately 14, those efforts will help our students even more. And fully implementing smart planner for every degree plan for every student will revolutionize the student's ability to plan for classes and stay on track. I want us to be focused on graduating our students with the highest quality education possible in the quickest time possible. Hence, most of my initiatives are interrelated. The third initiative is to reduce the time to your degree. Starting this fall, we will undertake a comprehensive space utilization review. We need to know what classrooms are available and when they are available. We did 
almost did not get our soon to be announced science building to be announced next month. <laughs> We almost didn't get that building because we were not using our space responsibly on campus. We're getting that science building that will provide more labs and classrooms for our science classes. And we will be following our campus master plan and ad adding additional buildings in the coming years. But we must justify the need. The space utilization plan has to be extensive we have to be willing to use the entire campus and the entire week, even Fridays and even weekends. <laughs> Our students deserve the opportunity to take classes even when it is not convenient for us and it is not convenient for them. I do believe that if we, quote, build it, they, quote, will come. <laughs> Some of you may have already heard that I've argued that we need to provide incentives for our students to take more units. If students take 15 units a semester, they will graduate in four years. 15 plus 15 equals 30 times 4 equals 120 equals a degree. Even an English professor like me can figure this one out. Once we eliminate the bottlenecks and once we have the classes available that the students need, we will give the students a $500 credit, a true incentive towards the next semester for every semester that they take 15 hours, 15 units. And we will advertise this incentive to every student time and again. Of course, I know that not all students are capable of taking 15 hours. Hence, for those students who are only capable of taking 12 hours, we will offer them $1,000 if they take an additional six units during the summer. Okay, the math is the same. 12 plus 12 equals 24, plus 6 equals 30, times 4 equals 120 equals a degree. <laughs> but believe me, I realize that a student's degree should never only be about math. It should be about quality and excellence. Still, we have a moral responsibility to help them avoid debt and to provide them with the very best education that we can give them in the shortest time possible. With these incentive plans, these incentive plans will not affect the quality of the instruction. I believe in our faculty. I believe that they will provide an excellent education to any and all students in their classes. With this incentive plan, I'm asking for a more robust summer program with more robust offerings. I'm also committing to looking at the compensation for faculty teaching those summer courses. And I'm further committing to looking at what we charge students for those courses in the summer. We need a more equitable program, and we need to provide incentives to the faculty and the colleges to provide a more robust summer school. None of what I've outlined can be done without appropriate data. With initiative number four of my work plan, we will create campus-wide decision support model. What does that mean? We will eliminate the multiple data center duplications on campus and thereby eliminate the silos that surround the data on our campus. We will create one source of data 
and will make that source available for all who need data. Rather than making decisions on the fly, I'm asking that we make decisions based upon a common, reliable data source with a common data dictionary. That is why we're implementing Smart Planner and Platinum Analytics, and that is why I intend to centralize our data analysis operations. When looking at data, however, we cannot forget our students. We cannot forget their needs. Many have to work while attending school. Many need scholarships and monetary support. Initiative 5 will create a centralized career and internship office to help our students find employment. We will create an electronic bulletin board to advertise jobs, including part-time jobs in the community. And we will place priority on hiring our students over others when possible, not to replace existing staff, but rather to provide additional needed services, as well as to provide our students with valuable experiences. Why? Because we know that students, if students work on campus, they will be more likely to graduate than if they're flipping burgers. Initiative six is also about our students, but it is also about our faculty and staff. I, like most of you in this room, am troubled by impaction. I find it deeply troubling when a student comes to, up to me with a 4.0 GPA and tells me with tears in her eyes that she was not accepted into the nursing program. I find it equally troubling when a faculty member comes up to me and tells me that she has two times the number of students that her department, in this case social work, can handle because those students have been flowing into the program because they can't get into psychology or nursing because those programs are impacted. Some good analyses of impaction have been done on our campus, but we need a campus-wide discussion of impaction versus integrated enrollment management. We need to develop alternative pathways that are sustainable and do not create a burden on the faculty and the staff for students who cannot get into their desired major. And we need to look at when it is appropriate for a student to declare a major. Should it be earlier? Should it be later? I don't know the answer, but for the sake of our students, we need to ask the question. We cannot let impaction or limits on full-time equivalent students dictate the quantity or quality of the education that we provide our students. We work at this university at Sac State because we want to make a difference. We want to transform lives, as our mission statement says. We need to graduate our current students so that we can provide access to new students. But as we take on the task of graduating our students in a more timely manner, my responsibility is to make certain that Sacramento State remains a great place to work, a place to which everyone looks forward to coming to every day, which leads me to the seventh initiative of my work plan. We must ensure that Sac State is a great place to work. And I say that because with this speech and with this plan, I am asking you to work. Work with me to make Sac Place an even greater place for our students. When I arrived, I asked for our exit and climate surveys. Sometimes you should be careful about what you ask for. <laughs> I got a pile of surveys, but I also got no evidence whatsoever that anything had been done about the information in those surveys. We need to tie the information in the surveys directly to our strategic plan to go for, excel as a place to learn, work, live, and visit. We need to use the information in those exit surveys and climate surveys. 
We cannot just leave them on the shelves as we have. Instead, we need to convene a task force that will create action plans based upon those surveys. That task force needs to be charged with providing strategic initiatives to address the information in those surveys and to make Sac State an even greater place to work. As part of Initiative 7, as part of making Sac State a great place to work, we will establish a leadership academy for both faculty and staff. We will also establish presidential awards for staff and faculty with non-traditional categories. We will hold a celebration in the library for all those who have authored a paper or a book this year. We also hold a celebration for everyone who received a grant or research award and for those who were supporting them in their labs. And as I mentioned earlier, we will support our DREAM Act students, our African American students, our Asian American students, our Native American students, our Pacific Island students, as well as all of all our other students. We must also and will support our lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community. For Sac State to be successful, we must focus on reaching out to the city and to the Sacramento region. Hence, Initiative 8, where I only got one more after this one. <laughs> Initiative 8 of my work plan, expanding our community outreach. I've already accepted invitations to join and have begun attending the meetings of the Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council the Sacramento Metro Chamber of Commerce, and Valley Vision. I have attended meetings of the Asian American Chamber of Commerce, the African American Chamber of Commerce, and the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and we planned a tour of all of the Chamber of Commerce. Because one in 20 members of the region are Sac State alumni, I've decided to sit on the alumni board rather than send a delegate. We need to engage our alumni. Especially, we need to engage them with raising funds for the Science Building and the Events Center. And we need to make the alumni feel that they are part of the Hornet Nation. In addition to me sitting on the aforementioned board, I'm actively engaging with Capital Public Radio, the board, the University Foundation, and University Enterprise Incorporated boards. And I've asked everyone on the President's Cabinet to sit on a nonprofit charity board. <laughs> at virtually every meeting at which I speak, I ask donors, politicians, and business leaders for internships and clinical rotations for our students. We are looking for, to expand University Enterprise Incorporated's California Intern Network so that we can include even more internships. Most importantly, we will be initiating an academic program needs assessment for the Sacramento region. This assessment will examine the demographics of the region and the educational institutions in the area. It will then do an inventory of all the recent hires in the region, subdividing them by the level of education needed for each job. Then it will map the curriculum at Sac State, at the community college, and at the local universities over those jobs in order to find where there are gaps or duplications. The ultimate goal is to find out if we are educating our students for productive careers in our region so that we can keep the people here and stop the brain drain. Of course, some students will leave the region, but we want to create an economic want to create economic prosperity as well as civic leaders. Our students will make the region wiser, healthier, and wealthier. Now, to the final initiative in my work plan. I got to raise money. <laughs> Fundraising. 
As noted earlier, we're launching a capital campaign, the first capital campaign for Sac State. We're recruiting chairs for the campaigns as well as committee members. We're finalizing the agenda for the campaign, focusing on the new buildings identified in the campus master plan and on scholarships for our students. We're organizing quarterly meetings and attending trainings. I am eating more salads than I ever thought possible with donuts. <laughs> I refuse to eat the rubber chicken. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> we are not, we are visiting San Francisco, Los Angeles, anywhere that we can to establish chapters for the Alumni Association and where we can raise funds for our students. I'm sponsoring at least one lunch a week with donors. It's been three on average for the first uh, two and a half months. And a dinner at Jody's in my house every week with donors, focusing on lo legacy donors. We will also be using the Julia Morgan House to establish the President's Circle, which will raise funds for study abroad. Only 81 of our students studied abroad last year. Yeah, that's a travesty. We will raise the funds for study abroad. for the food pantry, for club trips, for emergency funds for our students. We are looking for naming opportunities for the science building. That is our top priority. We also need a venue where we can have rock concerts <laughs> and distinguished speakers. So we're focusing on raising $50 million for the events center. The onus is on me, actually on Jody and me, <laughs> to raise funds for the university. We will do so. Remember, one in 20 members of Sacramento, the Sacramento community graduated from Sac State. Please help me engage them with the university. Please help me bring them onto, ca onto campus. Together, we need to build the Hornet Nation we need everyone to take pride in being a hornet. Maybe foolishly, but very honestly, I did not share the text of this fall address with any members of my cabinet, except my chief of staff, Lisa Cardosa, and the only other person who saw it was Jody. I pray provided you with a lot of information here, maybe too much. But I really wanted to give you the idea of what I'm thinking and where I'm going without let someone else distilling it. Right now, I want to do a big Rosanna, Rosanna Dana. <laughs> Some of you will remember Gilda Radner from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Never mind. For those who don't know that Saturday night routine, I am simply admitting that I may have th some things wrong and may have to make changes in my work plan. As I said when I began, we don't know each other. I want to get to know you. And after getting to know you, I must change many of the initiatives that I've outlined today. Nothing I've said is set in stone except the degree smart planner is. <laughs> Nothing I have said is set in stone, but because I have promised to be transparent, the initiatives in this address will be posted on the president's website. My goal with this address was to let you get to know me. I may have overloaded you with information and numbers, but I hope that you take away from what I have said that I am focused on students. I am focused on students, on giving students the highest quality education possible. If that means hiring more faculty and staff, we will hire them. If that means purchasing software, we will purchase. If that means raising money, we will raise it. As I said, I believe in you. I believe 
in the Hornet family in the Hornet Nation. Herky, come on up. <laughs> We're going to take about 10 minutes of uh, questions in just a minute. But before that, I want to end the speech the way I end every speech. So Sac State is number one, stingers up. Sac State is number one, stingers up! Whoever gets to the mic first gets the first question. <laughs> Boy, and I was told this faculty was going to eat me alive. Hello, Mrs. Nelson. May I ask you when those financial incentives for students will begin? When would it begin? Right. Soon as we've got enough classes, when we, I can't start it this week because we don't have the classes, we, we're bottlenecked. If we can get it in the spring and we can guarantee that we can give the students 15 hours, I can't tell them I'm going to give you the money if they can't possibly get the classes. So we have to know in the spring if we've got enough classes. We'll do analysis. So I think it'll start in January. All right, very good. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I didn't hear you mention anything about the diversity of faculty uh, and diversifying our faculty and as we hire new faculty. So could you talk a little bit about your plan for increasing the diversity of our faculty and staff here? Well, Cecil, you've been in my office about it, so you know what my plans are. <laughs> That's why I didn't have to talk about it. I always like to hear it. <laughs> we have created a diversity task force that is uh, beginning to work right now. Ed Mills is responsible for chairing that diversity task force. We are in the process of doing an inventory of all of the diversity efforts on campus so that we can look at it. Once we do that, they will come to cabinet, the diversity task force. They will talk to us and we will give them a charge because we will know what we need to charge them. Right now, just saying, go diversify this campus, that doesn't tell them anything. We want a specific action plan so that we can have diversity here. And we will work very hard to do it. Part of that will certainly be among the hires. As you saw today, we've got $2.36 million going towards hires. There's even more than that because there's 1.9% raise. The provost is going to have to make determinations, but we're going to work to make sure that our students are taught by people who look like them. That's the number one. Ex excuse me, I misspoke. That was the number two complaint in the, the exit surveys of the seniors this last year, that they wanted to see more faculty that looked like them. That's encouraging to hear. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Thanks. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, they're very encouraging. Um, Kevin Weir, I'm president of the California Faculty Association here on campus. If there's any faculty in the room, uh, we're having a meeting right afterwards in the lobby suite. Um, <clears throat> Shameless plug. <laughs> yep. Um, speaking of shameless, um, as most of you in here know, the faculty is in a contract bargaining campaign right now. You've given us some words of encouragement about faculty and staff salaries in regards to equity, which is within your power to do. Uh, I look forward to working with you on that. Uh, I am here to ask you if you will advocate for faculty and staff compensation packages to the chancellor, because he is not listening to us. Perhaps he will listen to you. We are discussing it. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not at liberty to say what I'm discussing. I really am not. I've, I've been asked not to, so. Um, but 
they are the, the spokesperson for us. You know that I believe in equity. I'm looking at equity raises for the uh, s staff for the next three years and two years, and then we've got to do compression after that. I am looking at directly at uh, equity problems now with the faculty. I think the salary inversion problem is, is real, especially for the full professors, and we need to uh, tackle that in next year and the next go around in the budget. I look forward to working with you on it. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin has also been in my office, so it isn't just Cecil, okay? Hi, President Nelson. Um, I'm Christine with the State Hornet, and I actually had a couple questions. Mostly, when would the students be included on the graduation rate boards? You mentioned something about like a SAR, SARENA. And my second question is, um, are students going to be more involved in the hiring process of advisors and faculty members? That is my intention, okay. I have always had the experience where we have always had at least one student on every hiring committee, and that is what I come from and I'm, what I'm used to. Uh, we will have, we just advertising for the Tsarina or the Tsar, we'll have a faculty student on that. We have included the uh, students in the diversity task force and we're waiting for ASI to give us the names for them. So we want to include students in every way that we possibly can. It is your university, by the way, if you hadn't noticed, right? Thank you. But the faculty own the curriculum. Good morning, President Nelson. Um, I wanted to ask a question. You regarded the undergraduate initiatives that will be pushed out. Well, I'm a graduate of Sac State and Women's Studies, and I will be attending the master's program. I was wondering, would there be any initiatives for the graduate program? I got asked this question yesterday at the Faculty Senate. And yes, we are going to increase the number of master's programs here on campus. I would like to see us move towards an audiology degree and a doctorate. I would also like to see a doctorate in nurse practitioner, okay? We are going to uh, work on more. We have in mechanical engineering right now, and maybe we have it in other areas in engineering. I just, I just know mechanical that we have a, a five-year program where you come in and you start taking your um, master's classes in that fourth and fifth year and you get your master's there. We're going to use that model all the way across the university. Um, I've been talking to Chevelle Newsom about it already and got the plans on how we can make that work. So that's going to be a big initiative in what we're trying to do today. And just one more question, um, because I am from a marginalized um, major program in women's studies and also I noticed in ethnic studies, do you know if there will be considerations for um, master programs more streamlined to those marginalized um, studies? I do not know. The faculty will make decide decisions about what new programs are here. If you want those programs, get the faculty behind you have them come forward and propose the programs. Because as I said, they really do own the curriculum and they have to decide what they want to teach here. So rally your troops. Thank you very much. Hello, President Nelson. Uh, my name is Brenda Martinez and I'm an undergraduate senior here at Sac State. Um, so you mentioned you would like to help Dream Act students, correct? And um, one thing, as many of you know, that Dreamer students do not receive federal financial aid. And the California Dream Loan Program was supposed to take into effect this fall, but there has not been funding through the CSU. So many graduate students, undergraduate students, aren't able to receive federal funds or loans. And so I want to know exactly what is your plan to help Dreamer students? I come from a university that had the largest number of DREAM Act students in the United States. We worked very hard to help them get their DACA papers, and we were very successful by getting pro bono lawyers to come in and work. We will do the same sorts of things here. We created a Mexican-American studies program that was very strong so that they had a home. We are creating a home for them here as well to be, so that they have a place to go and they have the support. I will be lobbying really hard for California to 
bring forward those funds. I'm not going to succeed in, on the national level yet. We have to have immigration reform, and we need immigration reform. And I know that's political, but I believe that. So as a person, as an individual, I will be working for immigration reform as well. In the state capital, on the other hand, I can work for Cal grants for the students. This is probably the last question, so. Hi, President Nelson. We met yesterday in the Faculty Senate. I'm Linda Radigan, and I represent one of the 27-year temporary lecturers here on campus. I hate that name. So do we. So do we. Um, I'm here because one of the things that we've experienced as lecturers, we have very little voice. And one of the things in composition that we've experienced that really plays into your concern about student excellence is the constant push to increase our class sizes. So as a writing teacher yourself, you know that when you give a full-time lecturer 25 more students, that's the equivalent of a sixth class that they're not paid for. But more importantly, I think, that speaks to your concerns is that we can't serve those students at the same level. And this is where, as you know, if they don't have that solid writing foundation and they get passed on because we miss them here and there, they can eventually stop coming to school because as they get into their upper division courses, they're not prepared um, with their, their writing needs. So I'm really asking what you consider might be available for you to do to help stop this constant push to increase the number of students in our classes where we can't serve them all. Well, I'm giving the provost a million dollars for additional lectures, so I think I'm doing something there. Well, yes, that's true. We just but, would like to, you know, we haven't seen that money in the past. And of course, I know you're just getting started. <laughs> uh, and, you know, funding more sections and things like that. We still have not seen the provost and nor or the deans committed to keeping our class sizes to, into reasonable numbers. I have said that I'm going to be honest and transparent. I don't know what the maximum size. I don't. Even, I haven't read a policy yet on what maximum size courses are. Yes, as a creative writer and writing and a writing program. I knew that any time I got over 32 students, I was in trouble, okay? And that they were usually graduate students because I did the, the whole graduate writing. Um, we have to look at the numbers and see what's appropriate, but we've got to get the sections in there. There are other courses, though, and this, I'm, you will see how honest I am. There are other courses that can grow. I had a faculty member in the other day who said that she had, it was a psychology course, and she had seats, but they wouldn't let anybody in there. I want to be able to see people get in as much as you can. Best course I ever taught had 800 students in it. Uh, it was a marvelous course on art. So sometimes you can teach some courses that are large, some of them have to be small. I understand. And I we have to look at it pedagogically. Minimum requirements per student. So that's where the workload comes in mm -hmm. and the challenges to meet with those students happen. You have my commitment that I'll look at workload. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, I am honored that you came. I am humbled with this job. It is a great job. It is the one that I wanted because I knew coming here I could continue doing what I wanted to do, and that's work with students. So thank you for supporting me. Please support each other, and please help me raise some money. <laughs>